this book um, was essentially a giant diagnostic of all the ways in which net zero had struggled to add up. And we identified four unsettled accounts of the current practice of net zero that were going to be the, the core kind of ditches that practitioners were going to get stuck in. I'll spare you the book talk, that's another time. But but I bring that up as context because what has been really exciting and invigorating is over the last 18 months or so, we've been working on the solution set. So this is really about how to make net zero add up, how to make the proliferation of pledges that now cover over 90% of the global economy, or global emissions, I should say, under some sort of net zero pledge. How to make that real and auditable and drive effective carbon markets that will um, make those, those pledges add up. So that's kind of the context in which Mark's going to give you his um, presentation today. I'm delighted to welcome Mark. Mark has been um, a fellow with Steyer Taylor and SFI for now three years. Uh, we were lucky enough to pull him um, from his 25 years of experience in the asset management industry. Uh, he has covered every corner of it in, in depth that um, that we are very lucky to have as, as in, in an academic setting. It is very unusual to have someone with Mark's background who has both a PhD in economics at the University of Chicago and then these decades of practice. And so it is really very much in the flavor of the work that we do at SFI and STC, which is very applied uh, research and analysis in service of practitioners uh, where we are, I, charting out the frontier of sustainable finance and energy policy and finance, identifying the key problems and barriers and innovations that are going to unlock progress going forward. So with that, I will welcome Mark Reston. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to spend time with us this afternoon. Um, I, it was about the worst title. I don't want to blame Katie. I didn't give her a different title. It doesn't sound very inspiring accounting for carbon offsets. So um, I want to frame it as um, we solved climate change and we're going to tell you how to do it. Uh, a, a, a better title that we should have gone with. I'm going to start with, um, call it two sets of background topics. One is how the world of climate action thinks they account for carbon today. And the other is how uh, the market, the carbon markets operate today. Um, you might ask why those questions are interesting or important, and hopefully I can convince you of that. Um, carbon accounting is important because we have to diagnose the problem and understand where the carbon gets emitted, by whom, and how to attribute it to people who are responsible for it. Carbon markets are important because it's carbon markets that are actually going to drive capital to the right places to decarbonize systems. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll agree with that assessment that those are two really important things that are functioning very poorly today. Um, let's start quickly with carbon markets. Uh, carbon markets exist in two different forms. There are what are called compliance markets. Some of you may be familiar with California's compliance market, the California Air Resources Board. The state of California basically says that if you meet certain criteria and you want to emit a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, you need to buy a permission slip. Is that's what it is. I mean, it's either it's something between a permission slip and a tax. Legally speaking, it has to be a tax. Um, the permission slip feature just sort of sounds nice. The state of California is saying, "Hey, if you pay us some money, it's okay to emit," which is going to come back. We'll, we'll come back to that when we talk about the, the carbon accounting. The other kind of market, the other part of the carbon market is the voluntary carbon market. If you've been watching anything in the news in the past, you know, six, 18 months about carbon markets, I am particularly partial to John Oliver's segment on carbon markets. But, you know, the recent one was it the Atlantic or the New Yorker about this giant fraud of a carbon trading operation in Africa. Um, 
there's the voluntary carbon market is the animal is the um, call it climate activist analog to the compliance carbon market. So in very few places, we've got California, we have Europe, and a couple of other markets where governments say you can only emit carbon with these permission slips. And the voluntary carbon market is trying to do a similar thing to say, if you want to emit carbon, you need to do something about it. And the need to do something is incredibly vague. The, because the voluntary carbon market is basically saying, buy something. It doesn't say what you're buying. It doesn't say what you're trying to do with the thing you're buying. So in fact, the voluntary carbon market sort of splits into two pieces that, um, that are often categorized as what are called offsets. So it's something I'm buying that makes up for the fact that I admitted a ton of carbon. We can split the voluntary carbon market into what are called avoidance offsets and removals offsets. Avoidance offsets are probably the thing you are most familiar with because they are most of the trading volume and they are most of the activity in the space. The um, avoidance market is the market that says, I'm going to pay someone else to not emit carbon. And that's what is supposed to absolve me of my sin of emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Um, sounds very odd. It is very odd to say that I can pay someone else to not do a bad thing, and that makes up for me doing a bad thing. That doesn't really make much sense. The other category of offsets are the removals, actual removals of carbon from the atmosphere. So to give you some idea of what trades in these markets, in the avoidance category, we put all of the things that sound like I'm paying someone else to not cut down trees. In the removals category, we put things like I'm paying someone to grow trees that capture carbon. Again, those are extraordinarily different things. Um, the the most important thing for the purposes of this talk is there is an endless supply of paying people not to do bad things. I, we're all, you know, Stanford students or closely affiliated with Stanford. I think you understand what happens to prices of things that exist in infinite supply. They aren't very high. They're not very valuable. They don't do very much. The removals, on the other hand, are a really complicated exercise. Um, if I remove a ton of carbon, I can't really give it to someone. I have to basically hold it for them forever. That makes for very difficult accounting, makes for very difficult descriptions of transactions, both intuitively difficult, but also legally very difficult to explain. So there are all sorts of challenges we face in the voluntary carbon markets. Are the transactions real? Are they transacting something that exists? Are they transacting something that doesn't really exist? What do they mean? This brings us back to carbon accounting. I raise your hand if you have any idea what scope one, scope two, scope three. So a good number of you do. The greenhouse gas protocol is the standard tool that the climate world uses to describe what's going on with carbon emissions. It's a very fun structure. Um, it was originally designed as a risk management tool about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And the idea was at the time that uh, carbon taxes or actual carbon constraints from governments were right around the corner. I was very, very optimistic. And what the greenhouse gas protocol did is it described roughly the big risks to a company from a potential tax or potential constraints on carbon emissions. So scope one are actual combustion emissions that enter the atmosphere. So the, the most common examples of scope one are things like power plants burning gas, power plants building burning coal. Scope one emissions are combustion emissions. And for this, the case of this discussion, we'll just say combustion emissions. So like 
burning fuels in power plants, burning gasoline in cars. Those are direct emissions from combustion. Scope two emissions are the emissions that result from purchased power, I'm sorry, purchased electricity, heating, and cooling. Again, roughly speaking, that's mostly electricity. Uh, scope three emissions are supply chain emissions. So that is the emissions in my corporate supply chain from all of my upstream suppliers. So when I, you know, if I were holding my Samsung phone, I would say Samsung has scope three and upstream scope three emissions from every single component it gets delivered in order to produce my phone. Downstream emissions are really vague very complicated, all encompassing, and nearly arbitrary. So for example, I'll, I'll give you, Alicia is always entertained by my crazy examples of what could be in scope three emissions. Um, if I wedge the gas pedal down on my car using my cell phone, that's arguably scope three emissions from Samsung. Um, if I am uh, running a simulation of an oil rig on my cell phone, then one could argue that is scope three emissions of all the oil coming out of the rig uh, on, on set, you know, tagged to Samsung. The whole problem of scope three emissions is that the boundaries and what's covered by downstream emissions are totally unclear. On the upstream emissions, Samsung's phone has hundreds and hundreds of components in it coming from probably almost as many suppliers and their supplier suppliers and their supplier supplier suppliers. Samsung has no idea who their upstream suppliers are. So now come back to scope one, scope two, scope three. Not all of these things are emissions. Only scope one emissions enter the atmosphere. Scope two emissions are counting someone else's scope one emissions. Scope three emissions are counting an unknowable number of parties upstream and downstream emissions. The result is that the greenhouse gas protocol is not a functioning accounting system. A functioning accounting system needs to count emissions once and it needs to count all emissions. It needs to be mutually exclusive and comprehensively exhaustive for those of you who either have worked at McKinsey or aspire to work at McKinsey. It's really important that you know the term MEC because every McKinsey chart you ever see is MEC. So the problem is that the greenhouse gas protocol cannot function as an accounting system because you have no idea what it's counting. Many times folks will say, well, it just double counts. And the problem is, no, it doesn't double count. It unknowably overcounts. And so we're left saying we have no ability under the greenhouse gas protocol to correctly attribute emissions to companies or emitters or households or consumers. So what we need to do is come up with a scheme that says we can actually do carbon accounting. Why do we need to do actual carbon accounting? Because if we're going to hold people accountable for their emissions, we have to be able to say that they can be held responsible for them. So just as an example, in the United States, under US law, there is no chance that we can ever hold a company legally responsible for something out of their control. And that's what you know, the greenhouse gas protocol attempts to do. So even if it were right, even if we could calculate it, the likelihood that it will hold up under US law to hold someone responsible for this is nearly impossible. We've had discussions. Yeah, I actually had a very funny discussion with a Stanford Law School professor to whom I said, isn't it crazy that we spend all this time trying to make scope free mandatory and then it will take years and years to work its way through courts for someone to finally say, no, there's no hope. And the inspiring answer that this professor gave me is it's not going to take very long. There's just no chance. So, you know, we agree we need a real accounting system. So where does that leave offsets? 
and carbon markets. Another funny thing about capital markets and investment activities is the investment activities and markets are generally exercises in matching assets and liabilities. So the entire banking business, the entire insurance business, most of financial services, even your retirement plans. I know all of you students have very large retirement plans, but the purpose of a retirement plan is to say, I have assets to match the future liabilities of what I'm going to consume in my retirement. Virtually everything we do in finance is about asset liability matching. The problem here is that if we don't have carbon accounting, we don't know what the liabilities are. If we don't know what the liabilities are, we have no idea what assets are that are necessary to match or diffuse the liabilities. So what our work is about doing is saying, rather than using the greenhouse gas protocol, we can use a system that is called e-liability accounting, which is developed off of cost accounting that says through this supply chain process, so go back to all of the parts of my Samsung phone, Every time Samsung is buying a part, a collection of parts from a supplier, the supplier sends them an invoice that says, I just sent you, you know, 62,000 chips. And these 62,000 chips cost $42,000 and in their entirety contain, I don't know, a, a thousand kilograms of carbon. And that happens at each step of a supply chain. It's very much like the entire accounting world functions today through keeping track of dollars. All we're saying is going from step to step in a supply chain, you keep track of carbon. So when I take all the pieces into the good that I want to produce, I get my pieces, I know how much the components cost, I know how much carbon is in them, I'm going to use electricity or I may use actual combustion to combine my parts into my product. I now know the embodied carbon in my product and I pass it to my customer. And at each step along the way, I'm accumulating these carbon liabilities. The question is, what is it that matches? What's the asset I need to own that matches that liability? And that's where carbon markets are going to come in. So if we say emitting a ton of carbon into the atmosphere is a liability, then can anyone take a guess of what the asset needs to be? Removal. Correct. Thank you. So the idea is if we emit the ton of carbon, we have to remove the ton of carbon. That's very different than the offset market operates today. Because the offset market set today, more or less, allows for this idea that if I emit a ton of carbon, I'm good if I pay someone else not to emit a ton of carbon. But you can see that that doesn't add up. I can always pay someone to not emit a ton of carbon. If that absolves me of continuing to, to drive emissions, we're making no progress. So. In essence, when we start talking about how to account for um, offsets, in the paper that I wrote with um, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Kaplan at, at Harvard and Carpet Ramana at Oxford, um, we talk about how to deal with the accounting problems of carbon removal assets. And we very clearly distinguish between you know, the first thing we say is we're talking about voluntary carbon, we're not talking about compliance carbon. Because under current practice, compliance carbon trading is simply permission slips to commit carbon. It has nothing to do with a liability. And then we say in the voluntary market, we distinguish between avoidance and removals. And we very clearly state that avoidance isn't an asset. It's a really nice thing. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, but it's not absolving you of committing carbon emissions. Therefore, you have to focus on removals. Then what we do is we describe the liability. And what we're saying, what we say there is if you emit a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, basically it's there for a very long time. 
we make the argument in the paper that let's call it a thousand year liability because if you emit CO2 into the atmosphere, you know, it's, it's not like it really, I mean, it, it sort of decomposes into something else. I'm not a chemist, I have no idea what, but uh, in a very, very long time, sure, the CO2 may break down into something else, but the problem is that doesn't happen. We have what we have is trees, nature, to a degree, we have the ocean. But when the ocean absorbs CO2, that's really not much different for the most part than dumping CO2 into the atmosphere. We dump it into the upper ocean and it changes the ocean. When we deal with um, uh, trees and you know, what we could call photosynthetic capture, it's temporary. It doesn't have the ability to meet the terms, to meet the duration of the liability. So what we talk about is this idea, all right, if emitting a ton of carbon is a thousand year liability, your responsibility as an emitter is to say, I have to remove carbon for as long as I put it up into the atmosphere. That's the only way to balance the accounts. That's a very hard thing to do. It's a very expensive thing to do. The reason we think this is so important is it, it lays down a very high bar for when it's acceptable to emit carbon. Because in fact, under rules like this, whether voluntarily imposed on ourselves for issues, or if we eventually get to a point where a legislative body will do anything, we can impose these rules in, in a mandatory fashion. Um, that sort of removal asset is extremely expensive. <laughs> So today, a carbon removal that is durable for a thousand years is running roughly five hundred dollars. What that means is that if we are decarbonizing using this strategy, then a company will spend up to five hundred dollars a ton to not emit carbon in the first place, because it's always going to be cheaper to not emit it then remove it, or at least for a long time, it's going to be much cheaper to not emit rather than remove. Um, is this making sense? Questions? Are there any questions from the... No, go ahead. Do they have to account for what they call the historically better possible? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there are a number of companies that are saying they're going to do that. Um, I think that's a, you know, that would be great. Um, the challenge is if you want to move to a sort of compliance and mandatory regime, it would be very hard to go back and accurately um, estimate past emissions in order to say we're going to require uh, moving assets to match past liabilities. Um, but yeah, there, there are a number of companies, um, tech companies, and people that have pledged to set to have pledged that they are going to undo all of their past emissions. Um, but it's actually unclear how how they're coming up with those numbers. But for example, um, and and so, sorry, let me just take a step back. So for example, what we describe is this notion of uh, carbon solvency. It says, if I emit you know, X number of tons of carbon, I have to own removals that match my liabilities. So my assets have to meet or exceed my liabilities. And we describe that as carbon solvency. Um, where this becomes particularly interesting around corporate pledges, is I'm sure you've all heard of companies making net zero pledges. The problem today is that net zero pledges don't mean anything. Basically, net zero pledges today, roughly speaking, mean something like in 2040 or 2050, I'm not going to emit any more carbon. No one says how they're going to do it. No one says how they're going to understand how much carbon they have emitted or how they're going to identify whether or not they have emitted any carbon. Under the way we talk about carbon accounting, what we say is 
all right if I, you know, at any point if, if in any given year, I know how much carbon I've emitted because I've kept track of my EY abilities. And if I'm going to claim my company and my products are net zero, then I have to be able to say I'm selling products that have no embodied carbon. So, for example, I can do that two ways. I can squeeze all of the carbon emissions out of my supply chain, which is going to be extremely difficult. Or when um, the um, components of my products or my service, whatever, um, when those things arrive in my facility, I know the embodied emissions that came from my upstream supply. I add it all up. And I say, I am going to buy removal assets that will match the embodied carbon of my products. And therefore, I can pass on my cell phone to my customers and say, I have retained all of the carbon liabilities of this product. And therefore, you are buying a product that it has zero carbon liabilities. I'm responsible for carbon liabilities. I hold the assets. My carbon balance sheet can be audited. I know that my carbon assets exceed my carbon liabilities, and you're good. It's not your responsibility. That's what a carbon neutral product or a carbon neutral a zero net zero product or a net zero company mean in a very precise way. The one of the most important characteristics of this approach is that it doesn't require any budgets. So it basically says nobody's allowed to emit carbon anymore because we have no way of managing a budget, we have no way of allocating a budget. So we don't have a budget. And so this says everyone's at zero. That's it. It makes it very simple, very straightforward. Now we can obviously you know, violate those rules if we figure out a way to allocate a budget, but that's a longer discussion. Um, once we match once we understand what the liability is, and we understand what the assets are, what the asset must look like to match the liability, we can then say, what do we do in the carbon markets? What do we do about all these things we see being sold in the carbon markets? What do they mean? For example, you know, again, I go to my John Oliver example. John Oliver talks about, you know, just not cutting down trees. And he sort of says, I want to, I'm going to, you know, pay me some money and I'll cut these trees down 15 minutes later. Now, imagine that is an avoidance offset. But imagine John Oliver said, well, I grew these trees, I grew them for 15 minutes, and now they're dead. What happens? Well, today, nothing really happens because the way the carbon market functions today is I, I, I don't know if any of you have seen carbon markets in operation. But you go out and you buy a certificate. Your certificate says, you know, you own a one-ton carbon offset, whether it's, let's assume it's a removal, not an avoidance. So you wave, I, I would wave around the room, here's my one ton of carbon that I bought. I removed a ton of carbon from the atmosphere. I'm such a good guy. That's great. What do I do immediately after I buy the thing and I wave it around the room? I actually tear it up and throw it away. Because what happens in the carbon market is as soon as you make the purchase, you retire it. Retiring it means you call up the company that issued it to you and you say, I'm done. I threw it away and no one else can own it. So what does that mean? That means I don't care what the certificate's worth is I tore it up and threw it away. The company that issued the certificate is thrilled because at, at least they know I'm not going to come back and complain to them about what I bought. More importantly, the underlying project that the certificate pointed to is absolutely thrilled because they have no need now to actually maintain the carbon that they've captured. So imagine, I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit more concrete and less you know, snarky about this. Someone develops a carbon removal project in Uruguay to say, I'm growing trees. They grow their trees, they sell their certificates. Um, the trees could last a reasonably long time. The trees are unlikely to last a thousand years, but that's okay because I buy, there, there's, a, a, there's a certificate issuing company that 
cuts a deal with the person who's growing the trees. They say, yes, you're growing trees according to our principles and our procedures. We will issue the certificates. The certificates have nothing to do with the trees. The trees are there. There's a company over here that issues the certificates. The certificate points to the trees over there. And I buy the certificate from someone who chooses to sell the certificate. That doesn't give me a legal right to the trees. It doesn't give me a legal right to the carbon. It doesn't even give me the right to sue the guy if he doesn't grow the trees. Forget about the scenario where 50 years from now the trees burn up. But that's where it, it becomes very handy that I tore the certificate up and threw it away. In the world we envision of the future, it says the emissions are a liability. I got to buy a certificate that actually entitles me to the carbon so that I have an asset. I also have to hold on to the asset. I have to hold on to the certificate. I can't retire it because I need the proof of the certificate to match my liability. Because I have the liability for a thousand years, I've got the certificate. Whenever I'm doing my financials, I have to make sure that I still have assets to match my liabilities. If the forest burns down, my assets impair, and I have to buy new assets to match my liabilities. So again, in this like future world in which you know that we are driving toward, that we we actually think we're making some serious progress at this point, just to be clear. This is hard, but we're making progress. Instead of reading stories in The Guardian, because like nine times out of 10 they're in The Guardian, that somebody says, um, there's a problem, you know, this gigantic project over here that claimed to have removed this many millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere, it turns out to be a fraud. Carbon markets are a fraud. Um, the world that we want to live in is the one that says, okay, um, this forest in Africa burned up, or this forest in Uruguay got some terrible infestation and everything's dead. What's the result? Um, these 16 companies took a you know, $2 million impairment for each of them because they lost their carbon assets and they replaced them the next day. It just doesn't matter. Once we have actual liabilities that have to be matched with actual assets, and we maintain this notion of solvency, then things going wrong, like that happens all the time in the corporate world. You know, every time we have a hurricane, companies lose assets in catastrophic losses. They are generally insured. They replace the assets. They fill the holes in their balance sheets. So in the world in which we see good carbon accounting for Emissions, asset, emissions liabilities and properly structured carbon markets where carbon removals are treated as a asset that has to match a liability, this whole problem sort of cleans itself up. Any more questions? We'll just keep going all day long. Yeah. I'll, I'll make sure people like are honest about the like reporting the carbon emissions they make if like any emissions are a liability against the like sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's always fraud. Like, you know, we have financial fraud all the time. Um, it's not a good thing. But in essence, the goal of e liability accounting method is that it's auditable and verifiable. So right now, um, scope, the, the greenhouse gas protocol emissions. Are not auditable. They're not. They're not um, structured in a way that they can be auditable because there are too many um, uh, discretionary decisions to make. So, for example, companies declare their own boundaries for scope three emissions. So, my silly example of I want to wedge the gas pedal down on my car with my phone, like sure. We can all probably agree that's probably out of the scope, uh, out of the range, a reasonable scope of Samsung scope three emissions. But in fact, there are no rules. It just says downstream usage. Um, so the point of a better 
accounting system for carbon is so that it's all auditable. So in, in, in this system, both the liabilities are auditable at each point in the supply chain, and the assets are auditable because they're, you know, they are actual carbon somewhere that you know, we can point to and verify. Yeah, uh, uh, this is this is great. This is very helpful. Uh, a couple of questions. One was building off on the last question. Samsung, as an example, or, or any other major tech company, as an example, uh, the information asymmetry exists at the absolute base levels of a part being manufactured in a village in India and Philippines elsewhere. So reporting becomes difficult from that level, and, and that allows a bit of discretionary power to that company to assume or, or have a modeling software that, that allows you a bit of leeway into the accounts that come in. So how does, and this is more of a question about how the e-library system works. And I had a quick uh, follow-up because afforestation or, or planting trees seems to be the easiest example, but but I was wondering as the time scales change, uh, wouldn't the so bio oil injection or CCS you in those cases where you're looking at seven hundred years, thousand years, the consideration of asset, the valuation of the asset would go up because you have a larger time scale against which you have removed that carbon. Okay. Okay. okay, so let me let me. Uh... Understood. So to your first question, um, in, we can have a trend. The, the, the way the uh, greenhouse gas protocol works, everybody's estimating everything. So if I'm Samsung, I have to sit you know, at my desk at Samsung and estimate all these things going back to you know, pulling ore out of the ground. That's absolutely impossible. If we had a system that said everyone's required to report, and in fact, we could simply have a number of large customers say, we're going to demand that everyone reports. And if you don't report, we're going to give you a penalty rate. So again, as by example, the greenhouse gas protocol sort of says, if you don't know the number, use industry estimates. Well, once you're saying use industry estimates, nobody has any incentive to do anything to reduce the industry numbers because they're basically going to say, I'm going to wait for someone else to reduce it because I'll benefit from their innovation that reduces it. If we say um, you can use industry estimates for another three years, but starting in year four, you're getting hit with the 90th percentile. If you're getting estimates, you're going to get better than estimates, or you're going to change your suppliers. You know, it's it's as simple as that. So we have the ability. This you know this is no different than happens in you know many financial contexts, um, where you know you basically say, look, I don't do business. I don't do business with people who don't get audited. Um, that's very common in financial counter. You know, when you have financial counterparties, or if you risk your counterpart. All we're talking about is risk to counterparts. I don't want to do business with people who won't give you real numbers. Doesn't mean there won't be fraud. Uh, I lost track of the other question. Remind me the other question. Uh, it was about the time scale of yeah. the Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what we describe in uh, one of our papers um, is this notion that um, a natively good asset. And by that, I mean an asset on its own, it can match the liability, is basically a reference asset. So in the paper, we talk about um, direct air capture and mineralization. So if you, you, know, you do direct air capture, you pump the CO2 into a underground high pressure slurry, basically if it sits there for two years undisturbed by seismic events, it will turn to rock. That's good. Like that's going to last a very, very long time. The problem is that's 500 bucks a ton. Everything else, much, much like 
I don't know how much you all know about capital markets, but in in um, fixed income markets, everything in the world trades as a spread to U.S. government bonds. So if we think about direct air capture and mineralization like a 30-year treasury bond, a very long-dated, riskless asset, everything in the capital markets trades as a spread to traders. So then we can say, okay, in the carbon markets, everything that is less permanent or riskier than direct air capture and mineralization is going to trade at a discount to direct air capture and mineralization. So, for example, to take the trees, this tree example, in most tree-based removal transactions today, someone's probably very legitimately saying, we're going to grow trees, they will store this amount of carbon, and they will probably store it for 50 years, let's say, barring some catastrophic event. Because, you know, the trees will die and start decomposing and losing carbon, which is a reasonably slow event in and of itself. <clears throat> But what will happen is someone's going to someone will someone can make the decision of well I can buy 50 years worth of trees you know 20 times that's fine that looks like an endowment so how much does it cost me to endow a an entity that can buy 50 years worth of trees every 50 years it's probably less than the cost of the direct air capture and mineralization today until those prices come down. Or someone says, well, I'm going to buy uh, trees once. I'm going to buy trees for 50 years. I'm going to insure my trees for 50 years. And I'm going to buy a 50 year forward on direct air capture and mineralization because 50 years from now, direct air capture and mineralization is going to be much cheaper. So, what we'll see, what we think will happen is carbon markets will develop these forward curves for delivery of carbon, much like financial markets have forward curves for delivery of everything. And so that's how we deal with the time scale and the riskiness. So we think about carbon removals as like, you know, and we, we get into some of this in the, the paper on accounting for uh, carbon offsets, this notion of like you've got delivery risk and you have impairment risk. So if I set out today to say I'm going to sell Shahab a ton of trees, um, he's going to say, Mark has no credibility to sell me a ton of trees because Mark's never planted a tree in his life, even though he lives on the side of a mountain covered with trees. Um, so he says, yeah, Mark, you want to sell me a ton of trees. I'll wait till the tree's there. When you point to the tree that you planted, and you're going to sell me the ton of carbon, then I'll pay you for it. So that's Shahab worrying about Mark's performance of actually delivering the carbon. That's a very different risk than I deliver the carbon in the tree and it becomes impaired because it burns down. So it's all about these, these very well understood uh, capital markets techniques of adjusting for different kinds of risks. For carbon offsets, are the energies, the net energy consumption or net carbon emissions from that carbon offset um, included in that in total value, in that total carbon value of that offset? For example, if CCS, if you're using a bunch of emitting a bunch of carbon from natural gas to power that CCS, does that include in the actual carbon offset itself? Right. Well, that's a, that's a that's a really good question. We actually are about to release a, a paper that talks about a very important um, related idea that is saying, um, we're actually looking, we're, we're talking about it in the context of scope two emissions. This idea that scope two emissions covers all of the carbon related to electricity, but it doesn't. It doesn't include all of the upstream carbon because the greenhouse gas protocol puts that in a different location. So the best example of that is, I don't know, how many of you have heard of all of the descriptions of, of different colors of hydrogen? Like, there's a rainbow of hydrogen colors. And the rainbow of hydrogen colors is a really convenient shorthand for how did I get the electricity that powers the electrolyzer because the hydrogen has zero scope to emissions? The problem is I can power an electrolyzer using wind. I can power it using solar. I could, you know, 
burn trees to you know generate the electricity that runs the electrolyzer. I mean, I can you know I can burn whatever I want, and the whole problem is scope two doesn't capture that. So one of the things we talk about in this paper is let's stop talking about scope two emissions and simply talk about liabilities in the electricity complex. But it's the exact same thing as the removal question. You have to look at the net result. So as you're, you know, when I deliver a product that is a ton of direct air capture uh, and see what, you know, direct air capture and mineralization carbon, I have to account for is there a net gain in the transaction? And that's easy to do in liabilities. It's almost impossible to do under the greenhouse gas protocol. Yep. This is really interesting. Thank you. Um, how do you think about the challenge of adoption for this uh, carbon accounting method, given the first mover advantage that the greenhouse gas protocol has? For example, I'm pretty sure the uh, last year's SEC climate disclosure rule, I think it's going to be finalized soon, is rooted in the GHG protocol as it's in the Bar Council for Camera Rules. Sure. Right. Okay, very good question. And um, we actually wrote a comment to the SEC saying, um, stop trying. Like, it's like, so, you know, we basically said use e liabilities. Don't use the greenhouse gas protocol. The greenhouse gas protocol cannot function as an accounting system. It seems pretty well understood at this point that the SEC rule is not going to include, you know, if the SEC manages to get a rule through, it's not going to mandate scope three emissions because it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's not going to hold up to legal challenges. Um, that said, you know, a lot of what, you know, we do, Alicia and I and others are working on is how to prove that we can implement liabilities and why it's a better approach. And we're, we're very frequently talking about pressure points where we know it's going to break. So for example, the most obvious one is the, you may have heard of something called CBAM. It's car, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms in Europe. It amounts to a, um, a, a tariff on embodied carbon. The problem is the greenhouse gas protocol cannot calculate a number that anyone is willing to accept as a, a basis of a tax. It's, it's fundamentally unknowable. Um, under the greenhouse gas program. So one of our, I don't know, say high probability beliefs is that um, as Europe implements CBAM, um, people are realizing, and you know, like, so what, much of what we're trying to do is say, look, here's an alternative. It's a real accounting system. Just substitute it in and everyone can go about the business. So there are companies that have been piloting using e-liability accounting who are also you know, dealing with the, the challenges of CBAM. And you know, they are on the front lines of this saying, we cannot do CBAM using the greenhouse gas protocol. We can do CBAM using e-liability accounting. It's a different, it, it's a, it's another step forward to get people to say we're going to treat our emissions as a liability in order to match it with assets. And you know, that's one where we're making some amount of progress. It's obviously extraordinarily hard to go to a company and say, we suggest you impose a thousand year liability on yourself. However, Many companies, especially like the, the leading climate activist companies, are doing a pretty good job. Like, you know, they are no longer buying avoidance offsets. They are only buying removal offsets. They are being quite conscientious about the kinds of removal offsets they're buying. And so, you know, I would it, it would not surprise me if, you know, some of the household name companies that you all know that are quite active in the climate activities, uh, 
they're probably in the ballpark of a 20 to 50 year liability that they are actually holding assets they could match a 20 to 50 year liability so for example one of the mechanisms for implementation we talk about is oftentimes today people's net zero pledges amount to saying we're matching our assets and liability for a one-year uh, liability, right? I match, you know, I emitted 10,000 tons of CO2 this year. I bought 10,000 tons of removals, probably, and I just tear them up and throw them away, and I'm good. So we sort of say, that's great. You're net zero with a one-year liability. Tell us how you're getting to a 10-year liability. Tell us how you're getting to a 50-year liability. And so, to a large degree, this is almost you, like in the in the weakest sense, we can describe this as a way to be very precise in describing what a company is doing with their climate action and how to apply pressure to tell them to do a better job. So, again, even under a voluntary regime, this can work because people can say, "Okay, look, the net zero pledge you made two years ago doesn't mean anything." Let's talk about what you mean to say your carbon solvent under what we call emissions liability management for a one year period. That's a really easy thing to do, a one year duration on the liability. Tell us how you're going to get to 10, tell us how you're going to get to 20, tell us how you're going to get to 20. That's the pressure we should apply because every time a company extends that duration, what they're doing is imposing on their supply chain a higher price on not emitting the first place. It is not our view at all that companies are just going to continue doing what they're doing. They're not, and they're just going to buy removals. It's too expensive. That's the whole idea. What we're doing is saying we're giving, we're endogenizing the price, and we're saying you set your liability. The market's going to tell you a price of the asset you need to match the duration of your liability. And then you are going to beat your suppliers over the head up to the dollar amount that cost you to remove. Because better to not admit it in the first place than have to remove it after the fact. Yeah. I was going to chime in on that. This is a really important question because it's sort of the risk we run into of being too academic and being right over the corner while everyone else goes off and does the wrong thing at scale. So just to come back to some of the things Mark said and hit a, with maybe a little bit finer point, because again, I think this is really important. So SEC proposed rule hasn't issued final rule. Lots of time in between in that intervening time, you know, Gensler is very aware of e-liabilities and in fact is very much a fan, if I dare say, of e-liabilities, but his comment is, who's doing this? Like, I can't write this in if it's not being done. That was 18 months ago. In that intervening time, we've got a bunch of work out, but there's also now something called the e-liability institute that exists in the world as a nonprofit that has run now a dozen pilots that are getting the kinks work through and the and the understanding work through to the point where there can be guidance. There's now sort of a private gap going on where there's where 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 big companies are writing into supplier contracts the like uh, emissions uh, uh, efficiency that's required based on their understanding now of having done these pilots for their suppliers. That's SEC. In the meantime, we've got California that got out way over its skis with SB two fifty three, which. Even though it's now passed, Newsom has gone on record saying this has a lot of kinks that still need to be worked out. Good luck, CARB. So there's still more to be. That's not a done deal, and it's very unclear how that's still. Good. So there's opportunity still, and we've got our foot in the door there to make sure that CARB maybe takes this out of a tailspin and puts it into more of an accounting structure. You've got ISSB, which through International Sustainability Standards Board, which through its S2 guidance has scope three in there too. But again, they're also working in recognition that they don't have an accounting standard they have a disclosure standard there's the iasb that d governs international accounting that is still needs something on climate so there's there's door there's we're, the goal here is keeping the door open to get actual accounting um while this disclosure work moves forward but also reaches its limits and the the, the flip side of all the progress on disclosure is anyone's now hearing the term green hushing, but there's now the com companies who have made their pledges are frozen 
um, because they can't make good on them with the tools that they have. And they've gone on record saying they're doing these things. So in addition to CBAM, you've got this sort of pressure now on companies where they're, they're having to kind of stop what they're doing and realize they need to either walk these things back or get a new toolkit and no one's making new pledges. So there's a lot of pressure. This square peg in the round hole that is the GHG protocol in an accounting framework, which it is never built to be, is breaking. And so there's this is the opportunity to have a better, have a round peg for a round hole. Uh, thanks for the talk. I was actually gonna build on this question because well, from Brazil, so we kind of have some problems there about a lot of companies understanding that climate change is important. So my question is about enforceability. I mean, like someday we're gonna have to make this mandatory somehow, and I'm sure we're gonna discuss CLM trails eventually. But the difference I think is that if I have a, a financial liability, in the end I'm going bankrupt. Should we have like a carbon bankruptcy mechanism or something like that? How to make this actually enforceable for companies that like, don't care about greenwashing in the end? Not sure if I make myself clear. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. So there are, um, I want to first talk, like, or build up to a, a decent answer to the question. So, and you'll be will add some things. But if, um, if we think about how, like, one of the questions I think you're asking is how do you get companies to adopt a liability that they don't have to adopt? Um, the laws around retirement plans did not exist in any form, really, until I don't remember the number now, 1972 or 74. I can't remember what year this was. But the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1972 set out all of the rules for retirement plans. Companies had retirement plans long before you had codified federal law that said, if you break these rules, you go to jail. The, the retirement plans that were put in place before then were companies saying, we choose to impose these liabilities on ourselves as a competitive advantage because we want the employees that we'll get if we impose this liability and provide something to our employees. And what happened is prior to the passage of ERISA, companies sort of saw the writing on the wall where ERISA was going. And so the leading actors were imposing ERISA's obligations on themselves long before ERISA passed. And like it's, I think it's such a good analogy that we've actually done a little bit of work to investigate could we actually technically use ERISA to do this. It's, it's a really aggressive stance. I still think it's theoretically possible. One of the funniest things I've heard from more than one lawyer is no lawyer is going to go on the record about this because their clients will be so upset because they're, you know, their clients don't want this liability. So ERISA lawyers won't, won't really talk about it publicly. Um, at least that's been my personal experience in talking to ERISA lawyers. Um, but the point is, even the, even the leading actors that do this, one of the first things that happens as companies voluntarily impose this on themselves is they are saying, we need removals now. And they are going to push up the price of the available nature-based removals. So therefore, the relative price between what are today very low cost nature based removals because the nature based removal prices are being pushed down by the existence of the avoidance offsets because there are plenty of people who are trying to get credit on avoidance offsets, not even nature based removals. But the more companies you have saying we are only willing to buy nature based removals, shifts the relative pricing between nature-based removals and technology-based removals, and it makes it clear that there's a market for technology-based removals. So those of you who are you know, capital markets players, like all that goes through my head when I say this is it's a yield curve trade, right? You're 
driving up demand for the short-term removals, which is making the long-term removals, you know, economically more interesting. So it drives capital allocation. I the other you know funny analogy I like to this is nobody has anything good to say about the U.S. healthcare system. It's terrible. I don't you know whatever political view you have, everyone agrees our healthcare system sucks. The one interesting thing to me about it is the United States has such ridiculously expensive drug prices that we voluntarily impose on ourselves, and therefore we make. All, we, we drive all the drug innovation that the rest of the world gets for free. So what we can think about is the leading companies that impose this liability on themselves and drive the carbon markets in useful directions are actually going to drive redu cost reductions to technology-based removals. And that's an incredibly valuable thing to do, especially as we move to a compliance regime. When do we get to a compliance regime? I have no answer to that question. It would be, you know, it would be nice if we had compliance. Um, it would be nice if we had a way to impose a budget, but we really don't. Okay. Yes, I will grant. Uh, if our goal, and I, I think this is really important, one of the things that the greenhouse gas protocol and climate activists for a long time have honestly and usefully done is focus attention on reducing our increase or actually halting emissions. The actual goal is to not increase atmospheric CO2. Like, I don't know how many of you are, have you all seen the Bloomberg carbon clock? It's this, this, you know, okay, that's actually my cousin who designed the Bloomberg carbon clock. And I, you know, I joke with him all the time, like, isn't the goal to just stop the clock? His answer is yes. All that matters is stopping the clock. It doesn't matter how you stop the clock. So I absolutely agree. If we were so successful as a global world, direct air capture and, 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 and mineralization is so cheap, yeah, the answer is who cares? So Again, if we think about the cost of removal as a price signal for driving carbon out of the supply chain, or we can flip this question around. Are you familiar with the term social cost of carbon? Okay, so the social cost of carbon is this attempt by economists to figure out what the current value of the harm from a ton of carbon into the atmosphere creates. There is a funky math problem in there that those of you who understand the math will appreciate. It is not very hard in one of those models. It's actually, I think, almost inevitable out of those models that the mean, the, the, the mean social cost of carbon, the mean that, that is the social cost of carbon doesn't exist. The distribution of the possible outcomes of the social cost of carbon is a distribution that doesn't have an expectation. It's just a, you know, it's just a mathematical construct. And therefore, the social cost of carbon doesn't exist. What our system does is it says social cost of carbon is irrelevant. What it says is the price that matters is the cost to remove. The social cost of carbon is unlikely, extremely unlikely, to exceed the cost of removal. Because you just move. So all we're trying to do, in fact, is drive down the cost of removal. Because it's driving down the cost of removal that's going to cause people to beat the carbon numbers budget. That's all that matters, is stopping Eric Rostin's clock. <laughs> 
Yeah, so what we can do here, Mark's not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. I was looking at that clock. I thought it was dead on. Yeah, well, you could be dead on on that clock. Yeah, that's Thank you, Mark. 